Um, and we're going to be in John chapter 7, and we're going to look at most of John chapter 7 and a little bit chapter 8 tonight. Um, and we're going to uh, look at uh, Jesus that's attending, uh, when Jesus attends a festival. Now, when, when I say um, Jesus attends a Jewish festival, what immediately do you think about? What, what festival do you immediately think about? Passover. Yeah, I mean, that's because typically that, that's what we associate um, Christ with, and that there's so much symbolism in that. But tonight we're going to look at Jesus. Jesus didn't just attend Passover. Um, in fact, there were uh, several different festivals that Jesus attended uh, that we know about, that are recorded. Um, there were three festivals that, that Jewish men were required to go to Jerusalem every year and attend. Uh, one was Passover, one was uh, Pentecost, and one was the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, so we know he, he went to those. Also, John records uh, that Jesus attended uh, the Feast of Dedication. Now, we don't typically call it Feast of Dedication. We today call it what? Comes at Christmas time. Hanukkah, yeah. Uh, so, and we'll look at that, you know, uh, later in our study. But tonight we're going to look at Jesus attending the Feast of Tabernacles. We're going to see that there's a lot of symbolism even involved in um, the Feast of Tabernacles. So it's not just, not just Passover. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to find Jesus in the Feast of Tabernacles. I would love, incidentally, uh, maybe when we get done with this study or at some point, to do a study on Wednesday night of, of all the Jewish festivals and how they relate to Christ. I've done that in other churches, and I, I think it's a very interesting study. So maybe we'll, we'll get there um, eventually, but tonight we're going to talk about the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles and Jesus' attendance there. All right, so let's dig in. What do you say? All right, let's start with verse 1 of John chapter 7. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brother therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of, of it that it works, that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. All right, so I give you just as a little extra handout, a uh, little supplemental material on, uh, on the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, if you find it helpful, great, put it with your notes. If you don't find it helpful, you, they make really cool paper airplanes, uh, so you might uh, could use it for that. But I, I find it interesting and, and maybe just a little supplemental material that would help you. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about this. So the festival that Jesus is attending in these verses is the Feast of Tabernacles, as we said. Let's talk a little bit about this, this festival. This is really cool. Um, how many of you like to go camping? No? Yeah, what's wrong with you all? You don't like... <laughs> so um, so that's, that's kind of what this, this holiday is all about. So you... Uh, uh, so it, it first of all it commemorates the Exodus and the wilderness wanderings. So that's kind of what it's there. It's a, it's a memorial of, of that. It comes five days after the Day of Atonement. It's going to be in the fall, um, September or October. Um, now, because the Jews are on a lunar calendar and we're on a solar calendar. 
That's why, you know, sometimes it's like, it's like Easter, you know. Easter's, Easter is situated around Passover, and Passover doesn't come the same time on our calendar every year because we're on a solar calendar and they're on a lunar calendar. So it, theirs has to do with, you know, uh, so, many, so many full moons. Um, it's going to come September, October. Um, so everybody goes to Jerusalem. All the males, uh, they go to Jerusalem. They cut down branches, and they build these little shelters, these little uh, lean-to huts, for lack of a better word. Now, you had to have three sides on it. One side was open, and you, had, you put a roof on there, and it was very specific. The roof had to be enough of a roof to, to be a shade, but not so much of a roof that you couldn't look up and see the stars. So it's very much, you're supposed to get this feeling of, I'm outdoors, I'm camping in Canaan's happy land, as the song goes, you know. So you're supposed to be able to feel like uh, that, you're, that you are reliving in some way the, the wilderness wanderings where they, they lived in temporary homes, temporary uh, shelters. Um, lasted seven days. Uh, you, well, you live in these shelters seven days. The gates of the temple are open. Um, you rest on the first day. You rest on the eighth day. Uh, there's two, two aspects that, that are very significant here. Uh, one has to do with water, and one has to do with light. Um, the, so every night of this festival, they would light these huge um, menorah. You know, if I say menorah, you know what I'm talking about. You've seen pictures, the seven-branched candlesticks, the Jewish menorah. All right. Most of them that you see, they're just a little thing that sit on a table. Not these. These were 75 foot high. There was four of them in the court of women in the temple. They lit those things. Can, they, can you imagine? It ignited I mean, it lit up everything, illuminated everything. You know, if you're camping in Jerusalem and, you, and at night you look over at the at the temple, and it looks like the presence of God is there because there's these four huge menorahs, 75 foot tall, and they're all illumined. Plus, you got people walking around in the court of the temple, uh, carrying torches and doing different uh, ceremonies and things. And so, uh, light plays a huge part of it. Um, and the other part is water. The, uh, the priest would go to the pool of Siloam and he would take a pitcher and he would dip water out of the pool of Siloam and he would pour it uh, at the base of the altar and he would offer prayer. This is two things. It, one, it commemorated the uh, God miraculously providing water from the rock in the, uh, the Exodus experience. It was also uh, a prayer for rain. When you live in the desert, water is very important. And when you're a farmer in the desert, uh, water, uh, you know, rain is very important. Um, and so prayers for rain were a big, were a big deal. I know in, in Wellington, you know, it's kind of, it's a very dry and arid kind of land in the, in the, uh, in the panhandle of Texas. And um, on the prayer list all the time, like it stayed on the prayer list at Wellington, pray for rain, pray for rain, pray for rain. And, uh, and one, and like, like one week, we got like rain like every day that week, like which never happens, you know. And I'm like, well, I guess we can, you know, switch to pray for rain to praise the Lord for rain. And an old farmer on the back says, we need to keep on praying. We can never have enough rain. I'm like, okay, well, maybe if we were thankful for what we got, we'll keep getting more. But, um, you know, rain was a big deal. And so that was, water was a part, uh, part of it. And then they would read, uh, they would read a, a book, a small book that was traditionally read there in the Feast of Tabernacles. Any, any, anyone you want to take a guess as to what the little bit? It's a book of the Old Testament. Job? No, not Job. What did you say? No, not the Torah. Book of Ecclesiastes. All right. Now, here, here's the, here's the real. Trivia question. 
why Ecclesiastes? Why, why would they read this at this time? Okay, so how does, how does uh, Ecclesiastes start out? Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity, all is striving after the wind. So uh, this idea in the book of Ecclesiastes that, look, um, life, you know, boils down to very simple process. Fear God and keep His commandments. And so all the superfluous things of life uh, that clutter us down, you know, really you can just kind of shed that away and get it down to the simple, basic parts of life. Fear God and keep His commandments. All right, what's Feast of Tabernacles all about? Simple life. You know, I'm going to build me a hut and live, you know, live in a, in a, in a brush arbor for a week, you know, uh, in Jerusalem uh, and just kind of camp for a week. Uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of cool. I mean, you know, it's, it's like a built-in vacation. You get to go to Jerusalem and camp for a week and see a light show every night. So, I mean, it's really a pretty neat deal. Uh, so, this is, the, this is the festival that Jesus is going to Jerusalem to, to celebrate, to be a part of that. Now, his brothers come to him. He's in Galilee at the time. Um, and his brothers come to him, and they say, hey, why don't you go up with your disciples and attend the feast? Now, why do they want him to attend the feast? Do what? Yeah, they, they, that's right. They, they're like, prove yourself. Uh, this is a good opportunity for you to prove that you are the Messiah. Uh, uh, you can gain some notoriety because, you know, you're working around Capernaum uh, in Galilee. Uh, you know, you're not going to... The big, the big dogs in religion, Jewish religion, they're, they don't hang out in Galilee. They hang out in Jerusalem. So, you know, I mean, like... you. If you're an actor uh, and you want to be a star, you don't you don't go to do community theater in Pryor. You go to Hollywood because that's where the big dogs run. You know, so you want to be a religious leader, you go to you go to Jerusalem because that's where the Pharisees, that's where the Sadducees, that's where the scribes hang out. So uh, go there. It, they also had this idea of. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to validate your ministry. Now, underlying this is their opinion of him, which is stated in verse 5, which is what? They really didn't believe it. They're like, why don't you go to Jerusalem and you know, prove yourself to, Jeru to, to your disciples? Show yourself to your disciples and, and, and to everybody there. Implied in that is, yeah, and us too, because we don't really think, you know, we grew up with, these are, these are his, these are his, uh, you know, his half-brothers, uh, uh, you know, Mary and Joseph's kids. Um, so, you know, think about, <laughs> think about those of you that have brothers. If your brother came up to you and said, I'm, I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God, and, you know, what would you say, you know? Whatever, yeah. And so he, Jesus got a very similar reaction from his brother. Now, they came to be believers later on. At this time, not so much. And it seems as though there was some embarrassment coming out of Galilee. Jesus had, uh, had been drawing huge crowds, um, and then he, make, he starts making these very um, tough statements, um, spiritually deep statements. Like, at one point he tells uh, the crowd, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you, you can't have eternal life. And the people that are there, they're like, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And the Bible says, uh, John chapter 6, verse 66, that from that time on, many of his disciples went away and walked no more after him. They followed him uh, you know, no more, walked no more with him. In other words, he lost a lot of his crowd, and really the, only the 12 was left. And he turns to Peter. He says, are you also going to go away? Peter says, where would we go? To whom shall we go? You're the one that has uh, the words of eternal life. But um, there seems to be some embarrassment on the part of the, uh, of the brothers that, that they're like, well, if you go to Jerusalem and, and do the works that you know, everybody's saying you can do, then you'll prove yourself once and for all. Um, 
But Jesus says to him, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, y'all, y'all, y'all go up. I'm sure Jesus said it just like that. Y'all go on up. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I'm not going to go uh, at this time. Why, why, why did Jesus not? Ma- and what he means by this, and we know this is what he means because he ends up going after the fact anyway. Exactly. That's exactly right. It, it, he, it's not time. He says, it's my time has not yet come. Um, my time has not fully come. Um, so when would his time fully come that he's going to make his entrance into Jerusalem as the king? Do what? Palm Sunday, that's right. Yeah, the triumphal entry. Palm Sunday, he's going to ride into Jerusalem on the donkey uh, to the shouts of Hosanna, uh, and he's, he is going to ride in as the king. Now, five days later, he'll be crucified as the sacrificial lamb, but he he will ride, he will make that ride. Um, you know, it, it, his earthly ministry, his, the, the, the height of his of his popularity is going to climax at the triumphal entry. Uh, after that, it turns quickly. Uh, the same crowd, it, people are fickle, are they not? The same people that are cry, crying out, Hosanna to the Lord! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Five days later, are the same people that are hollering, crucify him! So, um, and, and this would, when he rides into Jerusalem, at the triumphal entry, this will be his last hurrah. He, he's there for from Sunday until Friday. He's uh, he, he's crucified, buried, resurrected. Um, but this, you know, he this will mark his his his. If I can use these this term, his last hurrah. This is this is his swan song. Is that the word that I'm looking for? Is that the possibly? I'm looking to my grammarian here, and she's not giving me a lot of clues. He's, he's, you're not listening, yeah. So it's just like normal. You don't listen to me. Um, but, uh, but so, but this was not going to be the time. This was not that time. Uh, he was, um, he had more ministry uh, to to undergo. He had he had other things to do. This was not the time that he was going to ride into Jerusalem and die. So he's not making public appearance because it's not time. But he is going to make an appearance. He's going to the festival anyway, but he waits till the brothers go, and then he kind of goes and shows up in secret. Um, now, why did he go to this? Why did he choose to go to the festival anyway? Teaching is part of it. He, he was, he was, it was an opportunity for teaching, opportunity for ministry. Why else? That's right. Part of it was the law. Uh, so remember, Jesus, in order to be the perfect sacrifice, he had to keep the Old Testament law perfectly. All right, the law required that every male would appear in Jerusalem three times a year at these three festivals: Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles. This is one of those three. So if he's going to keep the law, he has to show up. So he will show up. He's just not going to do it in a public way. Um, it also this this time at the festival is going to sort of set the stage for his conflict with the Pharisees. Up until now, it's kind of been underlying, you know, kind of a, oh, he's kind of been a burr in the saddle of the Pharisees, but, but it hasn't really come to blows yet. After, after this week uh, in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles, um, they're going to make up their mind. Yeah, he's got to go. We, we've got we've got to do something and, and get rid of. They're not exactly sure yet how to go about doing it, but the 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 stage is set that that they're going to do what it takes to get rid of Jesus. Um, you know, and it will it will end by you know with his life. Questions. All right, let's look on in the verse. Uh, 11. Now, this is a rather long passage, but I want, I want you to read it. This is some of the things that are taking place at the, at the festival. So we're just going to read it um, through about verse 32, uh, and then we'll, we'll make just a few comments on it. But I, just, I mainly want you to just kind of see what Jesus is doing at the festival. All right, verse 11. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, 
where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said no. On the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. The Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know uh, no letters, having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? But why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? They're referring back to a healing that took place on the Sabbath. Do not judge according to the appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? I love that. Isn't this great? Verse 27, However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out, and he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from. I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, When the Christ comes, he will, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and chief priests sent of, of officers to take him. All right, let's talk just a little bit about this. Um, and you can kind of see through all of that the, the conflict that's already arising between Jesus and the Pharisees. They want to kill him. Now, why did the Pharisees want to kill Jesus at this point? Do what did you say? That's right. They 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 either didn't understand or believe that he came from God, or else maybe they did. Uh, and but they were afraid <laughs> if he gave too much power, then we lose. We lose control, and, and it was all about control for them. Um, you know, in verse 30, uh, you know, it says that uh, they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. In other words, it wasn't time for him to die, and no one was going to kill Jesus before it was time. And I think that's, that's a significant point that we need to see through all this. Every, you know, there was a lot of people that hated Jesus at this point. But nobody was going to kill Jesus until it was time. And that time would be on the cross, but it wasn't yet. Also, there was a little bit of cowardice involved. Look at verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and chief priests sent officers to take him. Uh, in other words, they, you know, <laughs> we're not going to do it ourselves. We're, we're, you know, we're going to have it done. Um, but but they're, they're very careful because they're afraid of the crowd. It's all about how things look. It's all about keeping our political power going. Um, so uh, you can already see kind of the dynamics that are forming here and, and the, the, uh, the basis which the Pharisees are working. Um, what was, what, how would you describe the crowd's reaction to Jesus? Positive or negative? Yeah, it's kind of both, and it? it's kind of a mixed reaction. Um, look at verse. Uh, look at verse twenty-six. Um, this is what the people say. Look, he speaks boldly. 
they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? In other words, some of the people are saying, hey, the, the religious leaders must know this is the Christ because you know, here he is speaking and they're not doing anything. But then look in verse 27. They, they, they add a question to it. However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he's from. Now this is referring to a, a, a belief held by some that, that the, uh, the Messiah, would no one would know his origins, that he would just kind of show up uh, as a mystery kind of thing. Um, that's, you see that question there, explain the question about where, uh, where Jesus was from. So some held the belief that the Old Testament didn't reveal the origins of the Messiah. It would be a, uh, a mystery. However, uh, that's not true uh, because the, the Old Testament, in fact, does re reveal that he would be born in Bethlehem. And if you remember when the wise men show up and they ask uh, Herod, where is he who's born king of the Jews? Herod goes and he asks the scribes, hey, where's, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? And they, they quote, well, in Bethlehem of Judea. And they quote the prophecy. So it wasn't, it wasn't an accurate belief, but it was held by some that didn't know Scripture. Um, you know, we've got homemade beliefs that, you know, that, that aren't in Scripture. God helps those that help themselves. and Cleanliness is next to godliness and all this uh, stuff. Um, and so they had those in those days too. And so there was this belief that you know, well, no one will know where the Messiah will come from. It'll be a mystery. He'll just show up one day. Um, and they're like, well, we know where he came from. He came from Nazareth in Galilee. So this, he can't be the Messiah. So they, they were mistaken in that. Uh, then look at verse, um, let's see, 31. 31, many of the people believed in him and said, when Christ comes, will he do more signs than these, which this man has done? So... You know, a significant number of people believed in him, but then 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring uh, and the chief priests sent officers to take him. So, you know, some believe, some don't. Some want to follow him as Messiah, some want to kill him. I mean, it, so it's a very mixed reaction among the crowd. Here's a good question. Why did the Pharisees hate Jesus so much? It's making them look bad. You know, he, he did a couple of things. Um, number one, he spoke the truth. And number two, he didn't play their game. And because of that, they hated him. <laughs> uh, he had them figured out. They, they, you know, they could fool, they had the people fooling, fooled into thinking, oh, we're, we're these righteous men of God. And blah, 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 blah. Jesus is like, you're just whitewashed sepulchers. You're, you're you know, you're pretty on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. And, and you're hypocrites, you're playing a game. And I, you know that, and I know that. So you're not going to, you may have fooled the people, but you don't fool me. And he speaks the truth. And he doesn't play their game. And they hate him for it. Incidentally, do what? Well, I was going to say, if, if, if incidentally today, if you do those two things, people will hate you from that. Can, can I just say that? If you, if, if you dare to speak the truth and you don't play the reindeer games, get ready. People are going to hate you. Um, but Jesus will love you. And, and that's more important than having, having uh, the love and, and praise of, of all the people. All right, I think we did we get all of our those questions. I think we did. All right, questions, other, your questions on those. Did we? I, 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 yeah, I, I didn't do it in order. Uh, so some of the Old Test, some of the people held the belief that the Old Testament didn't reveal when, uh, where the Messiah would come from. So that's why, uh, that's why they said, uh, well, we know where this guy comes from. He, and so he can't be the Messiah. That, that was the question in that. Okay, so now we're going to look at um, a part of the festival. So this is, this is neat. This is cool. So the Last Supper, you know, the night before Jesus dies, the Last Supper, we... we, we 
we commemorate it with the Lord's Supper. All right, but you understand at the Last Supper, what Jesus and his disciples were doing was taking the Passover meal, right? I mean, you, you, you get that, right? All right, but here's, here's what Jesus does. He takes elements of the Passover meal, the bread and the cup, and he elevates it and gives it new meaning in him. He takes the bread of the Passover and he, and he breaks it and he said, this is my body broken for you. He takes the cup and he said, drink from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for remission of sin. All right, so at, at this festival, at the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus is going to take elements of this festival and elevate them and give them new meaning in him as well. And one of those is this symbolism of water. So let's take a look at verse 37. Um, this is, don't miss this. This is good. Look at verse 37 of chapter 7. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? See again, there's misunderstanding here. Has not the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was? See, they, they missed it because they didn't realize Jesus was actually born in Bethlehem. Verse 43, so there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. And the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? In other words, we don't believe in him. Why should you? Verse 48, uh, 49, but this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Now look at this, verse 50, Nicodemus, we've seen him before. He who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? Then they answered and said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search and look for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And Everyone went to his own house. Okay, so um, water in, you've got you to get this picture. Every, every day of the feast, the priest would go uh, and, and he would take this pitcher and he would go to the pool of Siloam and he would dip water out of the pool of Siloam and he would bring it back and he would pour it at the base of the altar and, and, it, and he would pray for rain and he would... Uh, thank the Lord and commemorate God's miraculous provision of water from the rock in the wilderness. So at this time, when this great ceremony is going on, on the last day, now every day, all right, every, this is the last day of the feast that Jesus says this, every day the people are watching this. Here comes the priest, here he comes, he's pouring it out. Here comes the next day, he's coming it out. And everybody's watching this process. And on the last day, when the priest comes to pour it out, Jesus stands up and says, hey, if anybody's thirsty, let them come to me. and I'll give them water to drink. Uh, um, I'll give them uh, living water. Uh, I am in 38. Uh, if, any, uh, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Can you imagine the impact this would have had? Here comes the priest, pour out the water. Next day, here comes the priest, pour out the water. Here comes the priest, pour out the water. On the last day, as, as, as everything has built to this point, Jesus stands up at this point as the priest is getting ready to pour out the water and says, hey, anybody that's thirsty, let him come and drink from me. I'll give him living waters. This, now, now you... You think the Pharisees were mad before? <laughs> now they're really upset. Um, so uh, Jesus is using water here as a symbol of what? 
The Holy Spirit, right, the Holy Spirit. Because he says, um, uh, well, verse uh, 39, this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. Um, so just as God had miraculously provided for the physical thirst with Moses in the, in the wilderness during the Exodus, okay, now God is doing something new, something greater. God is providing for the spiritual thirst of man through Jesus Christ. That, that's the significance of what's being, uh, what's being done here. Now, what's the reaction of the crowd? It's mixed again, isn't it? Um, there's division among the crowd. We're told in verse 40, um, verse 40, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, they said, this is the prophet. Now, this is, this is a, a statement towards faith, but it's inadequate. Jesus wasn't just the prophet. Others said, verse 41, this is the Christ. Now we're getting closer to, to, to an, uh, an adequate description. But then there's this question, will, will the Christ come out of Galilee? So there, there, there's a misunderstanding that causes people to balk at believing in Him. Same thing today, people who misunderstand the facts about Jesus, um, will, that will cause them sometimes to balk at following uh, Jesus. Um, but you look at, uh, and then verse 43, there was a division among the people because of him. But then you look at Nicodemus. Now here's a guy that in chapter 3 of, of John uh, had come to Jesus and they'd had this long discussion on being born again and you know, John, uh, uh, Nicodemus just didn't seem to get it. You know, how can I enter my mother's womb for a second time? And, uh, and Jesus like, no, that's, you know, that which is born of, uh, you know, uh, of, the, uh, of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And you don't get it, Nicodemus, but, you know, I'm working with you. Well, it seems like God is still working with Nicodemus because now he, now he seems to be very close to believing. Um, and he comes and he says, you know, uh, hey, does our law, our law judge a man before uh, you know before it knows what he's doing? And they said, "What are you from Galilee? Are you one of his followers?" Uh, so Nicodemus has already reached a point. At, you know, at first he comes at night. Now, now notice notice the progression of Nicodemus. At first he comes to Jesus at night, so nobody sees. Now he openly says, "Now wait a minute, what are we doing? This this is not right to condemn this man without you know hearing all the facts." And then in the end, he's going to be one of the ones that, that buries Jesus. So, um, you know, he, it's neat to see Nicodemus' faith grow and progress uh, through this time. Questions on that? Yes, sir. All right. Well, um, well, so, so some of it was confusion. Some of it was being deceived. Um, and you, you, you perhaps give them more credit than, than is due them, that they knew well. Yes, they, they knew it for their bar mitzvah, but it's just like today, um, not everybody that grows up in church knows the Bible and, and understands it. Even people that can quote Scripture doesn't necessarily, can't necessarily tell you what it means. And so perhaps we give them, to say that they understood the Scripture completely may give them more credit than what credits do. Um, and then part of them was, part of them were deceived. You know, why, why is it that so many people that heard the gospel you know, a hundred times still reject Jesus. Not because they haven't heard the truth. They just, you know, um, they've chosen to, to reject. They, they know. All right, so we're going to now switch to, uh, and I'm going to move quickly, but we're going to switch to John uh, chapter 8 at verse 12. Now you're going to ask me, well, wh why are you skipping verses 1 through 11? I have a reason for that, uh, and we'll talk about that next week, and, and well not next week, next time I'm with you, which will be three weeks, I guess, um, but um, we'll talk about why I'm skipping it now, and we will talk about 
verses uh, 1 through 11 then. I, I promise we will, but we're skipping it for now. So let's look to verse 12, which I believe continues the same event. This is still Jesus at the festival. So we're not breaking continuity here, all right? Verse 12, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where, I'm, where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Uh, and yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your Father? And Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. All right, so now we look at another uh, significant aspect of this Feast of Tabernacles that Jesus is going to pick up and add new meaning to. So in this, in this festival, as I told you, uh, each night, these huge menorahs are lit. There's four of them in the court of women in the, in the temple. They're 75 feet high, 70 to 75 feet high. Um, and of course, they're seven branched. And you can imagine it's like a huge torch burning. Plus, they're carrying torches around in the, in the court, and the whole place is lit up. Now, this is, remember, the last of the festivals. Jesus stands up and makes this statement. I'm the light of the world. Now do you get, you, you, you see what he's doing here? He's already made the, the statement as the priest is pouring out the water, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me. Now as the torches are, are, are being are lit, as the torches are burning, Jesus stands up and says, by the way, I'm the light of the world. Uh, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of the Again, yeah, everybody, you know, is, is just amazed. Um, so um, they light these candles. Uh, it, it was supposed to originally commemorate the the guide, God's guiding light in the wilderness, but now it's it's uh, it is Jesus is giving it the new significance and say, you know, I am not the bearer of light; I am the light. Um, so the Pharisees questioned what Jesus, they, they say, oh, you're bearing witness of yourself. Your, your testimony's not true. Um, so the idea is that in, in that culture, the law was facts had to be established by two witnesses. It wasn't just, it wasn't, it, you know, if I came and I said, well, I, you know, I saw so-and-so doing something, okay, that, that isn't enough to convict it takes two witnesses that have to both say. Um, that's why the trial of Jesus was never um, a legitimate trial because they could never get the witnesses to agree. They could never get two of them to say the same thing, but yet they crucified him anyway. Um, uh, but Jesus, you, he validates his testimony. Uh, first of all, he says, well, even if I do bear witness of myself, my witness is true. Uh, uh, he says, "You don't know where you you don't know my origin. You're you're debating. Well, did does he come from Galilee? Does he you know does he come from Bethlehem? Where does he come?" From? And he said, "You don't know where I come from, and you don't know where I'm going." Um, now, where did Jesus really come from? He come from heaven. Where is he going? Going back to heaven. And he says, "You don't you don't know this because you don't know my father." And his testimony. He said, "You know." Here's the two witnesses. My testimony is one. The Father's testimony is the other. Um, so he, he validates his own thing. Now, there is uh, this, this whole section on the Feast of Tabernacles is ultimately completed when Jesus performs this miracle uh, in John chapter 9, verse 1 through 7, where he heals this man that's been born 
blind. And he, he spits. Now, this, this is amazing. Don't lose this here. This is, this is good stuff. So he, he's already made the statement, I'm the light of the world. All right? You've already got the, the, uh, the, the priest dipping water from the pool of Siloam. Jesus has made the statement, if you're thirsty, come, come to me. I'll, I'll give you living water. And he made the statement, I'm the light of the world. He, he finds this man born blind. He, he reaches down, he spits on the ground, he makes some mud, he rubs it in his eyes. And this is what he says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Who's at the pool of Siloam? The priest drawing water <laughs> for this ceremony, right? So here comes this man down here. This blind man comes down here. Well, while all he's going on at the pool of Siloam, and this blind man that's been blind ever since he was born comes and washes and he goes away seeing. Wait a minute. The priest wasn't expecting that. I'm just going down to get my bucket of water to go pour it out in the altar. And all of a sudden, who? and then the question is, who did this? Well, it was this man, Jesus. The same one that's, that, that the Pharisees are wanting to kill. And then he makes this statement. I'm the light of the world. Look at verse, verse, uh, verse uh, five. As long as I am in the world, I am in. I am the light of the world. So, um, this is this is how Jesus transforms this this uh, this festival, water and light, into now being all about Him. Now, this I am statement, I told you that, that the book of John is built on seven signs uh, and seven I am statements. And the, I, the, the, the signs often accompany an I am statement. So here's one. And it's, it's I am the light of the world. Um, and, it's, and the sign is being, the man being born blind. Uh, now, I want to show you in John chapter 3, verse 17. It's right after our very famous and familiar verse, John three sixteen. But I want to pick up in verse 17 what Jesus has to say. Three seventeen. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of of the only begotten Son of God. Look at this. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So this is... This, this is the old, John says this is, this is the great condemnation of man. Jesus, the light of the world, come into the world, and men rejected the light because their deeds were evil. Uh, so anyway, that's Jesus at the festival of, of, the, of the Feast of Tabernacles. So, questions? Yes, sir. I said, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear everything you said. Two witnesses and Jesus being one. Two witnesses, right. Right. That's right. Right. So that, that was the two witnesses. Was Right. And I, was, I meant to point that out. If I didn't, I, I, I didn't, didn't make that. Point, but yeah. So Jesus being the first witness, his father being the second, and there's the two witnesses that that confirm the fact. No, they wouldn't. They weren't going to accept that. Right. That's right. That's right. Yes, I believe that's referring to his death, um, and. Um, the crucifixion, yeah, so, 9-4. Yeah. Very similar to when uh, the question is asked, 
why don't your disciples fast? And Jesus says, you know, the, the friends of the bridegroom don't fast while the bridegroom is with them, but there will be a time when he's taken away and then they will fast. Same kind of idea there. All right, well, I've enjoyed tonight. Um, held you over just a little bit. Sorry about that. Hopefully no one's worse for the wear. Um, next, so I'm gone for two weeks. Uh, next Wednesday night, Phil's got it, and I think he's going to continue your study with uh, that he's doing with you in James. Um, so you can be here for that. And then the following Wednesday night, Dale Gowdy's going to do... Um, Wednesday night with you. This sun, coming Sunday, um, Parker, the Reverend Dr. Parker Smith is going to be preaching for you. Isn't that, my, my kid's preaching and I'm not even going to be here. But, you know, I mean, that's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and, uh, and then Trey has got, my other kid, Trey, has got the following one. So I've got three sons now and one granddaughter, Alexa. So anyway, <laughs> uh, so, hey, pray for me, and I'll pray for y'all, and we'll get back together in about two weeks.